Hey guys, Cell here and welcome back to some Sweetest Monster. Let's get started. All of a sudden, Belle's face seems far too close. I can almost count each of her individual eyelashes, feel her breath against my cheeks. Got you! Uh. All of a sudden, I feel something against my lips. Something soft, warm, and not entirely unwelcome. Belle's kissing me. This isn't like her previous pecs either. This is a real kiss, unabashedly romantic. I know Belle isn't a human, but she seems awfully familiar with human customs, so I doubt this is some kind of mistake. She's not that naive. I think she's even more smarter than I th than I am. Actually, to have tricked me like this, I can't help but feel taken advantage of. Yeah, especially since you're out on a date with her, and you said that she was your daughter. What are those good people going to think now? Better come up with an excuse fast. I was right. Belle's no fairy tale princess. She's the wicked witch for sure. What does that make me? The idiot. She presses against me, demanding, and I gasp. Belle takes my shock as a further invitation. She presses forwards, pushing my back against the chair, and her tongue enters my mouth. She tastes of ice cream, shockingly sweet, and her tongue is strangely cold compared to the warmth of her lips. I feel my heart seize up in my chest. My mind goes blank. When was the last time somebody kissed me like this? I can't remember. Sally certainly doesn't. We're too busy being antagonistic about small things, stupid things, to trade open affection like this. I think I must be kissing Belle back. You think? When Belle finally draws back, her lashes fluttering, her lips curve into a mischievous smile. Her face is pale as ever, not a hint of a blush on her cheeks, though she was the one who instigated the kiss. I'm the one who's embarrassed, breathing heavily, my face burning. If I were any older, I might have had a heart attack. It was wrong, I know kissing her was wrong, and yet, it felt so right. Forgive me for the old age cliche, but at the same time, it felt right. <laughs> but maybe it felt right because I'm a pathetic old man who hasn't been getting enough action from his wife. It doesn't mean much. What man wouldn't try to argue that kissing a teenage schoolgirl was, in some sense of what the word, right? I know a lot of people who would disagree with that assessment though, particularly the workers at the store were led to believe that Belle was my daughter. Maybe I can try and backtrack. I could tell them she isn't blood related, of course not. I'm just her stepfather, would that make it sound any better? I don't think so. No, by this point I don't think there's any salvaging this situation. The workers behind the counter really are looking at me now. This isn't just baseless paranoia, it's the unquestionable, unshakable truth. They look almost as surprised as I do, their mouths open. They're not the only ones, the other patrons are staring at me too. Even if I hadn't said Belle was my daughter, my behavior would still be unacceptable. I mean she's wearing a schoolgirl uniform, for Christ's sake. This is bad. This is very, very bad. Ah, uh, well, um... But I don't get to finish my explanation, that's probably a good thing too. Laughing cheerfully, Belle takes hold of my hand, I oblige, my body feels strangely light. Like a hollowed out pepper. Come on, Dad, let's go. I want to go shopping. You promised you would pick me out some new clothes, remember? Uh, um, yes, of course. <laughs> that gets. Did that save him? I allow myself to be dragged away by the playful devil that is Belle, not before I laid down a crisp 10 euros note on the table, of course. I might have committed a grave social. Oh, Pop, and kissed my daughter in the middle of an ice cream parlor, complete with tongues. But I'm not a thief. I may be a dirty man, but I'm not a thief. Even I have standards. Standards of never being a thief, but being a dirty, dirty old bastard. This is schoolgirls. <laughs> that was the greatest. Even to you, but not to me. I must have looked like a. a I don't even want to know what I looked like, either a pedophile or a deviant with bizarre sexual fantasies. Maybe both. Damn! Why the hell did you do that? 
Because it was fun. You're trying to ruin my reputation for fun. <laughs> Don't be like that, Robin. Belle giggles, brushing a few stray tears from the corner of her eyes with her fingertips. You teach me music. You teach music at a primary school. It's not like you have much of a reputation. Well, you might be right there, but still, I'd like to retain what little scraps of dignity I may have. But did you see the looks on their faces? It was amazing! I thought that girl behind the counter was gonna faint. <laughs> Deriving this much amusement from the suffering of others is a sign of sadism. Well, people from certain cultures do call the beings like me demons. Maybe they weren't far off the mark. Come on, it was all harmless fun. For you, maybe. <laughs> You're right, I'm sorry. This is very serious. Belle nods sub subtly, her arms folded, trying to force an expression of contrite guilt. Her eyes are upturned, much like the Virgin Mary seeking guidance from God. This facade, however, does not last for very long. Her shoulders start shaking within seconds, and laughter begins to bubble from between her pursed lips. <laughs> she laughs so hard she's doubled over, arms round her middle as though she might explode from the hilarity of it all. She laughs openly, without abandon, just like a small child, her laughter is without grace, discordant and jumbled, but it is precisely because her laughter lacks harmony that it is so very charming. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone laugh like that before with quite so much zeal. Though I'm shaken by the earlier events, and maybe my face is still beat red from embarrassment, I soon find myself joining in. I want to be mad at her, but I can't. How could I? It would be impossible, especially when she looks so happy. Ah, see? Belle points at me, a triumphant smirk on her lips. She wore a similar smirk just after she had kissed me, although marking me as her own personal property. You laughed. I made you laugh. Because this situation is very ridiculous. What can I do but laugh? <laughs> I know, right? You shouldn't take yourself so seriously, Robin. You'll get wrinkles. I already have wrinkles. I know, but more wrinkles. Belle giggles, pressing her hands against both sides of her face. It's because I prescribe a strict diet of at least one amusing experience per day that my skin doesn't sag. No matter how old I get, I'm several centuries old, and I could still pass as being 16. I roll my eyes, though I can't stop myself smiling. How does she do it? Dermatologists all over the world are baffled. What's that meant to be? It sounds like it could be some kind of dumb internet advert. You know what the internet is? Well, duh! How would I be able to live in the 21st century if I didn't know what the internet was? I don't know, I thought the digital era might have passed you by since you were busy being a cat. Come on, cut me some slack. I'm a pretty trendy person, I even know how young girls wear their uniforms. Belle strikes a pose, one hand on her hip, her skirt still as short as ever, catches in the breeze fluttering around her thighs. It's a good thing the two of us vacated to this river, only a short walk away from the main shopping center. I got tired of various pedestrians looking us up and down and to hurting. No doubt they looked like the workers in the ice cream parlor. Assumed I was Belle's father. Disgusting, I can just imagine the little old ladies thinking as they adjusted their beige handbags around their shoulders. How could a father let his little girl go out dressed like that? I wish I could have explained to them that I've told her to dress sensibly multiple times. But she doesn't listen. Belle's too willy, wily, and willful. Though she isn't sporting her fluffy black ears and tail, she really is just like a cat. She does whatever she wants. God, Belle. I sigh, running a hand through my hair. What am I going to do with you? You're impossible. Yep, that's my middle name. Speaking of which, I don't know your last name. You never told me. I pause. And I doubt Belle is your real name either. It isn't, but it's a lot cuter than my true title, and it's easier to pronounce, too. Christ, I hope you're not some kind of Lovecraftian abomination. Hey, 
I resent the term abomination. That's discrimination. Discrimination against us non-humans. Discrimination, huh? I didn't know spirits were all that concerned about being politically correct. Oh, you'd be surprised. Belle smiles. Just stick with Bella, I like the sound of my name when you say it. Plus, it suits you. What do you mean, it suits me? You like music, right? Don't you think Belle is a cute and musical name? And it's less obvious than Melody. You think Melly's name is too obvious? It isn't hard to guess one of her parents plays the piano. Let me put it like that. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize, though I'm not sure who I'm apologizing to. Belle for being so transparent, Melody for giving her a name which, with the gift of hindsight, turned out to be so incredibly unfitting. I guess I've never been very good at naming things. The goldfish I had when I was a kid, Bubbles, and Goldie are a testament to that. All the more reason we should stick to Belle. Let's keep things simple. Right, simple. I can do simple. Simple enough to not get caught kissing your daughter? I groaned, burying my face into my hands. Simple. Yeah, right. My life has been anything but ever since I had the misfortune of running into Belle. Now, maybe I st it started earlier than that. I have the vague feeling that ever since Great Aunt Clarice bought the awkward and aloof Belle from that pet shelter, my life has never been quite the same. That kiss in the ice cream parlor right now is just the tip of the iceberg. People always say black cats are unlucky. I thought that was a silly superstition. But now I feel inclined to agree with them. Oh my god. What if anybody in that ice cream parlor knew me? Oh no, whatever shall we do? How would they know you? I'm a primary school teacher. What if one of those kids attended my school? That isn't going to look good, the highly esteemed. I make small quirky marks with my fingers as I say this. The statement is far too ridiculous for me to say it without some physical indict indication of its blatant dishonesty. Music teacher Mr. Hawkins getting off with a girl who goes to St. Catherine's. Come on, you're overthinking things. I bet nothing comes of it. You bet, but you don't know. There are more primary schools around here than the one you work at. I'm sure nobody knew it was you. Well, you're probably right, but what if? Oh, what if, what if, what if? What if you get run over by a car? What if you contract a terminal disease? What if you fall into a lake and drown when trying to rescue a cat who can already swim? Damn it, I hit that again. That was a low blow. Whatever. I'm just saying, who cares about all that? It's because you humans get so hung up on countless possibilities that you never do anything. You just while your lives away as though you're waiting for a bus in a shelter, a bus that'll never come. You just need to take life by both hands and go out there and do something. Once more, I'm humbled by just how much Belle seems to value life. It's strange to me, particularly since Belle isn't a human herself, and by her accounts, has lived far longer than I have, than I ever will. I guess you're more of an optimist than I am. But of course! Belle smiles as though it should go without saying, toying with a strand of her hair. You don't live for as long as I have, for you're a pessimist. Pessimists are more likely to give up without even trying. It's only by clinging to a positive attitude that no matter how adverse your circumstances that you can overcome the doubt and the worry and the fear. To be reborn again and again and again. I love being alive, you know? There's so much to see and to do. No matter what you humans say, I don't think I'll ever tire of living. As long as there are people like you in this world. My voice for her keeps on changing. Lord. I stare. She. Belle stands by the river, still clad in her silly school uniform. However, under the light blue sky, she looks strangely celestial. Almost like an elegant figure in a painting. A relic but from bygone years. Now lost the annals of time. 
When she talks this, like this, with her typical childish inflections and light-hearted teasing, she sounds as old as she is. Wiser, too. Far smarter than me. The water ripples slowly, dark blue. Oil on a canvas. I really do love you, Robin. I didn't just kiss you for a cheap thrill or some perverse entertainment, though that certainly was part of it. I did it because I wanted you to know how I feel. I've loved you for so long. Ever since you tried to save me, I didn't have a voice back then, so I couldn't tell you how I felt. But I thought every single day for the last 30 years, it's what kept me from going insane. Sounds like you owned it, right? You belong to me now. I don't want anybody else to have you. I am a very possessive person, and I don't like sharing. Belle takes a step forward, crushing the scrubby undergrowth beneath the soles of her black shoes. She cups my face with her hands and peers into my eyes. Oh god, what's the undead eye Belle gonna do? She feels even closer to me now than she did at the ice cream parlor. Maybe it's because we're all alone. There's nobody to come between us. Just my own guilty conscience and ghostly thoughts. But I soon push those aside. Rabbit beating my heart spells all doubts. I feel my eyelids falling shut as though compelled by some greater force. Maybe it's because I've grown up on cheesy Hollywood romances that dictate during kiss scenes both participants must close their eyes. This is probably quite bad. Against my better judgment, I think I might be falling for her. And no, it isn't just because of the short skirt. It's not every day a man hears a confession that sounds quite as sincere as this. Belle's right, my heart really does belong to her. From the moment you tried to save me, our destinies became interlinked. You've already committed to me, Robin. You can't escape now. Just try to leave me. If you dare, I'll drag you back each and every time. <laughs> oh god. And where the hell have you been? Oh lord. I was now looking forward to returning home after my rendezvous with Belle, and this is exactly the reason why. Sally sits at the kitchen table, her arms folded, one leg crossed over the other. She glares at me, her eyes narrowed into slits. Given her pose, coupled with that look on her face, she could very well be an, un, a judge on The Apprentice. I wonder if she'll tell me that I'm fired. Fired from being her husband. Good riddance. Look, I, I'm really sorry. You've been doing that a lot lately. Sorry? You're sorry? You think you can just say sorry and that everything will set straight, do you? No, of course not. I just... I was caught up with work. Which is a complete and utter lie, but Sally doesn't need to know that. Or rather, I don't want her to know that. But I think she sees through me. Her eyes aren't quite as large and piercing as bells. Sally has always been fairly astute. Work? Of course. Let me guess. It was another meeting, was it? I want to retort with a defensive I really was at a meeting yesterday, but I know I can't. That would only confirm the fact that this time I wasn't at a meeting at all. Instead, I bite down on my lower lip, unable to say anything. I don't have any words to placate Sally because they're all lies. I know it, and I'm pretty sure Sally does too. She's my wife. We've been married for more than 15 years, so I should respect her more than that. I don't like lying, I never have done it ever since I was a kid, but I can't help myself. In this situation, the truth would be, sound far more ridiculous. I'm sorry, I was just having an emotional encounter with the reincarnation of my great aunt Clarice's pet cat. Like Sally would believe that. I thought you were going to make more of an effort, Robin. Didn't you promise Melly we were going to go out tomorrow? That's right, I did. I, I haven't forgotten, Sal. Well, that's great. It's great that you haven't forgotten about your daughter, but do you want me to go give you a round of applause? Maybe a standing ovation? Ovation. 
Look, don't be like that. I already told you. Things have been pretty hectic. I'm kind of stressed out, but I do want to go out. I want us to have fun together, like a family. A family, huh? You have a funny way of showing it. Yeah, well, it's because I'm a guy. Doesn't it come with the territory? Stoic, distant, bad with feelings. Men are from Mars, women are from, v from Venus. Don't think that you can get away with your behavior by spouting Victorian gender politics. Next, you'll be telling me about separate spheres and straight lacing, then I might really have to hit you. Please don't. As a primary school teacher, I don't condone physical abuse. Huh. Sally Holmes, it's hard to leave. But I think my silly comments were able to slip through the cracks in her armor. At least she looks like a little calmer now. Qualified? I wonder where that word came from. In this scenario, I would be more correct in saying salified. By the way, by the by, Melly said where she wanted to go. She did? I must admit, I'm a little surprised. I promised Melly I'd take her out tomorrow, but I wasn't entirely expecting her to take me up on the offer. Let me guess, she wants to go to the ice cream parlor. But we were just out with Belle. Maybe she has more faith in me than I thought. Yes, yeah, she did. You would have known that yourself, Robin, if you'd been back in time for dinner. I'm sorry, guilty as charged. What was it for dinner, by the way? Pork chops! I left yours in the microwave. It'll be cold by now, but I could hardly do anything about that. It's alright, I never asked you to become a Time Lord. I can just warm it up, no trouble. Sally lips quirk again at my comment, though she tries to keep her inadvertent smile under control. I hate it when you do that, Robin. Do what? Tell jokes like that. It makes it infuriatingly difficult to stay angry at you. Even when I know I should. Then don't be angry. Please, let's not. Not when we're going out tomorrow. Sally inhales heavily and shakes her head. Alright, alright, fine. For somebody who can be such a bungler with words, I can be surprisingly smooth at times. Yeah, smooth. So where did Melly want to go? The ice cream parlor. What do you think? What are Melly's fondest memories? Going to get ice cream with her daddy. Our holidays to Whitby. Whitby, more like. We used to go there a lot during the summer holidays, Sally and Melly and I, but Mother Nature was against us and it was nearly always raining. I don't think we got to go to sunbathing once. Well, that's England for you. I don't think Whitby would be Whitby if it weren't under a constant cloud of rain. No wonder that annual goth festival takes place up there. I can't think of a better place for dark, gloomy people than dark, gloomy Whitby. For some reason, Millie always loved going to Whitby. She liked examining the ruined chapel, meandering through the cobblestone streets, and rifling through all the tacky little gift shops. The fact that she never got to swim didn't seem to bother her, probably because Melly doesn't actually know how to. Sally and I kept saying we'd take her to the local leisure center, but when she was younger, neither of us ever got around to it. In any case, I think Melly would have enjoyed Whitby far less if we ever did manage to make it onto the beach. We went to Cornwall a couple of times in the past, and Melly never appreciated the warm beaches or bright blue waves nearly as much as she did being bundled up in her pink anorak, pelted by the rain. What a contrary girl. I guess she's pretty dark and gloomy herself. That's right, Melly loves Whitby. It's one of her favorite places. Well, that's a humble enough wish. Whitby isn't too far away. Only an hour or so, give or take. Right, if our sweetheart wants to get wet in Whitby, she can get wet in Whitby. I have no qualms about that. You might want to think about packing an umbrella or two, though. It never hurts to be prepared. So she doesn't want to go to the ice cream parlor? If so, we might be saved. <laughs> Probably. Robin, do you do remember the pack to picnic camper? I'm doing that, Sally dear. It's just a second. The hamper is a cute little knick-knack made of wicker. It looks like something Red Riding Hood might carry. Skipping through the forest on her way to see her great sick grandmother. Sally tried her hardest to make today as perfect as possible. She woke up at 6 a.m. on the dot when the birds began to chirp on the telephone poles to prepare this meal for the three of us, our happy family. 
It's half seven in the morning now, the sun sleepily peeking out through the clouds, and we're all dressed, ready to face the new day. Even Melody is awake for noon, a rarity for her on the weekends. She sits at the table, doubled over like a tomato plant that's come loose from its supports. She notices a cup of coffee in her pale hands, hiding behind the curtains of long black hair so it's hard to see her face. Well, at least she's awake, that's something I suppose. Damn it, I did it again. I take the basket with me and nudge my way out through the front door. The boot of the car is already open, loaded with umbrellas and raincoats. It seems like a bit of an odd mix, packing items used to protect oneself in the rain and picnic basket plus blanket. They seem mutually exclusive somehow. Oh well, if Sally wants to have a picnic in the rain, I suppose that's what we'll have. Sake or not, Sally's sandwiches always taste nice. I deposit the basket in the boot alongside the umbrellas and turn back towards the house. But I'll make it more than three pieces, however, when I pause. There's something soft rubbing against my leg. A distinctly familiar sensation. Oh god, it's spelled in cat form. She wants to come along. Am I right? It's a cat. A black cat. I know right away it isn't Belle. Belle's eyes were far greener than that. But the cat still catches me off guard. Feels like an omen, a portent of misfortune. But um, but um. Robin, what are you doing? I jump guiltily, though I don't know why I feel guilty. I'm not doing anything wrong. Uh, oh, nothing. I just got a little waylaid, that's all. Waylaid? Start to panic. Why am I panicking? There's nothing suspicious about being nuzzled by a cat, is there? Oh, I see. You've made a friend. How cute. It, yeah, uh, I guess I'm pretty popular. A real ladies' man. Haha. <laughs> hmm. I've seen a black cat a lot like this one hanging around the neighborhood lately. Uh oh, you have? Have you? Hmm. It was the most peculiar thing. Such bright green eyes. You don't say. That would explain why Belle seems to know almost everything about me. As she slink around my front garden often trying to peer into our windows, I said as she's a yonder day. The thought is unsettling. I haven't seen a cat with bright green eyes for a while now, though I think she was astray, didn't have a collar. I bet she was abandoned, the poor thing. Sally says. People really are horrible. They think a cat is something for Christmas, but can't commit to them for life. I feel sorry for her. So why don't we bring her into the family? It could only make things better. By that I mean worse. If only you knew, Sal. If Sally hates people who can't commit to keeping a pet, I'd hate to know what she would think about me. I can't even commit to my own wife. But I don't tell Sally this. I can't. There's just no way. Do it. She think I've lost my mind. Do it. For a few brief moments, I wonder if I have. Do it. Alright. Grabbed Whippy is more or less uneventful. Melly sits in the backseat of the car, curled up on herself with her head against the window. She doesn't say anything. Alright you guys, that's it. Gonna be it for this episode. See you guys in the next one. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you then.